We're live. All right. All right. So, welcome to the first episode of We the Individuals, where we are dedicated to the novel proposal that we each choose our own manner of being governed. Uh, we are going to be talking about some of the topics that strike our fancy. And tonight, for the first episode, we of course picked one of our favorite libertarian punching bags, Bernie Sanders. Uh, so for those who don't know me, my name is Chris Calton. I'm one of the moderators at We the Individual, and you can also find some of my own projects at the YouTube channel Anarchris. With me, of course, is the owner and uh, uh, founder of We the Individuals, Jeff Peterson II, um, hated in the left libertarian community, I'm sure, and ambiguously homosexual to the rest of us. <laughs> and then, of course, joining us as well, would be uh, Will Tippins and Andy Catherman, who I'm still getting to know, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves a little bit, but they are also moderators at We the Individuals. So without further ado, gentlemen, I would like to start by hearing each of you, if you can, just give me a little introduction to yourself since I don't know you guys that well other than Jeff. And I would like to hear just a brief take before we get into the specific yeah. details on just your thoughts, the good, bad, and the ugly of Bernie Sanders. What, what are his pros and what are his cons from a libertarian standpoint? Will, let's start with you. Uh, I cut out there for a second, but uh, I assume you just wanted an intro and general thoughts? General thoughts on Bernie Sanders and, and just introduce yourself a little bit if you can. Okay, well, uh, Will Tippins, I am, uh, as you said, I'm not fully acquainted with, with you and Andy. I've known Jeff through his, uh, his, his impassioned rants against... Uh, Against the left libertarian movement, and uh, and uh, just well, most of us know him. <laughs> yeah, well, just just been a fan, but uh, so I am a uh, recent law graduate, basically stuck in purgatory after taking the bar. And Bernie Sanders is uh, to me just just uh -huh. another same talking head. Not not a whole lot really, uh, you know, uh, not a whole lot special about him. And that's really what bugs me is the the, the comparisons that he gets to. Someone like Ron Paul, as a as someone who I consider a real outsider, but that being said, he he does have uh, some different. He's not as simple, uh, you know. He's not as one dimensional as a lot of the other candidates that we see kicked around. But uh, so that's just my general <laughs> general take on it. But okay, so you would say he's he's different than the rest of them, but he's not the. Uh, uh, identical, typical politician that we're used to seeing, which I think is fair. Jeff, are you having some connectivity issues? I'm gonna... Oh, no, I just needed to get my headset. So you guys oh, know. yeah, cool. Yeah, do that after we start. I guess that means, Andy, let's, let's uh, hear from you. Yeah, sure. My name is Andy Catherman. Um, I am a uh, develop software developer, application developer by day, um, and I am a father by night, and when I don't have, when I have my free time, which is usually never, I'm interested in liberty and economics and ethics, and so uh, happy that happy to be a part of this, and uh, humbled that you guys would think of me to uh, to do this with me. So, with that said, um, I'm sure we'll be getting to know each other a lot more throughout the course of this podcast or whatever we want to call it, screencast. And uh, as far as my thoughts on liber uh, on Bernie Sanders, um, I think he is. Uh, He's definitely. I think um, there's a couple of things I like to say about Bernie Sanders in general. I think it's um, interesting that he is in the race at all. Um, he's kind of older, and um, I think before before the whole run, this run, I think most people would have like written him off as kind of a crazy old guy who has messed up hair. But um, I think he it, it's interest. He obviously it's kind of like the Trump effect. Um, there's just something about him and what he's saying, how he's connecting with people that uh, is somewhat attractive. Now, we, uh, I have tons of things to say negatively about his uh, ignorance on many things morally and economically, but um, at least he's, he's – uh, it's interesting that he, he's anything but um, Hillary Clinton, although he probably shares a lot more in common than people think. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for uh, this round of commentary. Sure, sure. No. All right, Jeff, uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, you know, I think Will and uh, Andy touched base on a couple of things. And, you know, I, when it comes to Bernie Sanders, I think that my biggest grievance, one of my grievances with him is not necessarily him, but a lot of his supporters actually will come out and say he's talking about a lot of the issues that 
you know, needed that aren't being discussed, such as wealth inequality, and that's pretty much the whole liberal Democrat spiel is wealth inequality and the one percent, and that's you know in a way true, but you know, although he's talking about it, doesn't mean that's necessarily a good thing, and I think that. Um, you know, he has the problem, what the problem is a little bit figured out, but his solutions for solving these problems, like all statists and leftists, are, uh, would just make the problems worse. It's just like Milton Friedman's uh, timely quote of, you know, how, you know, um, I forget his exact words, how he says that they confuse, you know, the policies with the uh, good intentions and, and policies uh, with the outcomes and everything. So that's pretty much my... Uh, um, my uh, beef with him, and then also I'm a little bit more uh, biased against the left as well. So that's one. That's my. Uh, <laughs> that's my opinions on uh, Bernie Sanders. Uh, if if I if I can interject, I, I think a lot what uh, what bugs me about Bernie Bernie Sanders uh, is that in a lot of ways it's kind of like the Occupy Wall Street movement because they have a lot of as you said they they see they see issues that. That should be seen. You know, they they diagnose problems. They just can't come up with the solutions that right. make sense. And they often, you know, advocate more of what is actually the root cause of the problem instead of uh, actually doing anything new or, or <laughs> different or radical. So, to me, that's that's the the frustration. Uh, the frustrating part is just the it's sort of circular. Of you know, he 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 his supporters laud him as some sort of uh, new. Uh, new wave thinking type of guy, but he's yeah, he's he's a he's a revolutionary without revolutionary ideas. I, guess. I think I think that's kind of a, a funny thing that I'll see is that I'll hear his campaign and his supporters say that you know it's a grassroots campaign, and it's like you got to make up your mind. It's either a grassroots campaign or he's a socialist status Democrat. You can't have you can't have both. That's I mean, Ron Paul was grassroots because. Uh, you know, you saw people, you know, like, I remember seeing Ron Paul for the first time, I was on the freeway, someone made, like, a homemade marker sign, Google Ron Paul, Google and that's Ron the first Paul, time yeah. I heard of it, and, you know, someone who calls in for more government intervention is, is at, 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 at Anything that I can, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, cool. Google, well, let me, oh. Google, Google Bernie Sanders, and what, what are the, you know, the big, what's the big idea? I mean, what's that? <laughs> All right, let me, let me jump in so we can uh, kind of get into the uh, nuts and bolts of this. So what I'm going to do for the people uh, watching this is I'm going to play the role of the libertarian socialist because I know as libertarians a lot of us are hearing some of these arguments for why libertarians should, under some circumstances, support uh, Bernie Sanders. So that's kind of what I want to tackle today, how you guys are going to respond to those article uh, arguments. I wore my uh, Che Guevara shirt just for this occasion, so I'm really diving into the role of the uh, the socialists tonight. So I want to start with one of the ones that, that I've heard the most um, as a college student myself, and Will, I'm sure you'll have an opinion on this since you just got out of law school, and that's his uh, his plan for college tuition uh, where he really, he's advocating essentially a single-payer system uh, for college tuition just like he's advocating single-payer health care. Um, uh, well, Will, let's start with you again since since you are just, just uh, recently graduated. W what do you think about this system? Should should libertarians support this at all? Oh, okay, well, that's, you know, that's one of those multi-layered arguments, really, but, uh, I mean, you look at the, the system that we have in place, and there is so much intervention and, and uh, and regulation and uh, distortions through the uh, artificially low uh, state-sponsored uh, loans, and I have so many friends that who were in undergraduate, especially a couple years longer than I was, who are swamped with you know just so much debt, and they have degrees that essentially are worth less than the fake uh, you know the fake calfskin that they're that they're printed on. So I mean it's. Uh, on one hand, you know, I guess you have to hand it to Bernie. He's not. He's at least trying to uh, think a little outside the box. I mean, you, we were talking about the other day the single payer uh, healthcare system. While it's you know it fails for all the reasons that all central planning fails. I mean, one could make the argument that it's superior to the mixed system that we that we currently have, uh, at least in the short run. Uh, but anyways, no, I, I I that's I don't have. 
<laughs> well, th- that, let's let's talk about that a little bit. Your last statement, where it might be better than the mixed system, because that's some of the arguments I'm hearing. There are a lot of people that said, "Well, yeah, in a perfect world, in Ancapistan, perhaps it would be better if this were left up entirely to the free market." Uh, but we could acknowledge, you know, with the, the, I mean, just the student loan debt that that so many of us are are burdened with because of this this mixed, this corporatist system that, uh, as I would call it, um, would it not be better if we can't have a purely free market to at least have this single payer system so maybe it's not as good as it could be, but it would be better than what it have. Jeff, I'd like to hear your diatribe on this. What do you have for me? As far as it being a, you know, a better than what we have, I, I, I think intentions wise I think it might be better but in, in, in practice you know in economics and everything I, I disagree I think as far as free college in general is that you know if looking at it you know a college costs you know rise faster than other prices precisely because college is being substantially socialized and you see the same thing in every other um, semi-socialized good or service I mean you, like like Will was touching base on you take healthcare prices go up and quality goes down um, because the people consuming it aren't the ones paying for it. So you don't have to produce a quality product to make money. You can raise prices and um, without losing customers and the value of college education will plummet even further. So, you know, I think they say, I just, I, in, long, in a nutshell, I just think they have, a, you know, the, their good intentions are, are put in front of them a little bit more than they're just going to create more of the same problem. And, and just to clarify, I, I certainly uh, I didn't mean it to sound as if I would advocate single payer uh, healthcare or uh, you know for an education system. But I I do think that it can be. There is an interesting argument that could be made uh, by uh, I don't know like a Steve Horowitz type I would imagine. Uh, but but uh, you know uh, I think especially with education that the problem is so so deep reaching. It comes. It's sort of a fundamental question of what we what we even view what is education I mean what is it other than human capital that you know that is that happens to begin early in life so I mean when when we have this conception that we have in America today of what education is this rigid formal uh, you know 12 18 years it's it's almost like a prison sentence you know with the the mandatory attendance and all that so really I it, it's it's difficult that, that that's the fundamental problem is, is starting somewhere when everything is so far from what you would consider a uh, a free society might consider education to be. Yes. Let, me, let, let me hear a little bit from Andy, but Andy, I want to narrow this just a little bit further and say, would there not be some benefits at least? Yeah, I mean, we can, we can talk about the economic consequences of sure. it, which I think most of us are going to agree on, but would there not be at least some benefit if sure. everybody were able to go out and get a college degree? I mean, isn't that a plus that we can acknowledge as, as capitalist libertarians? <laughs> well, I mean, um, I'm not really going to say, like, um, who is going to be the net benefit beneficiaries, but, like, in any... Um, you know, socialized type system. You're gonna, there's gonna be winners and losers. Uh, it's just kind of the, as an economist, you know, we would look at, you know, given such and such edict or decree or policy, who are gonna be the losers, who are gonna be the winners. So maybe just offhand, you know, this is gonna be, um, I mean, it's pretty much gonna like unionize, if not uh, all, or not unionize, but it's going to obviously incentivize um, and reward all of the teachers. In the sense that they're going Why is to. That bad? No, I mean that's. The, I'm saying that's going. Those are going to be winners. Sure. So the so that's that's going to, um, you know, think of it as like a job safety forever. So I don't even know if they have tenure. Uh, I think they do have some. If you have tenure in uh, in college for professors, so I would expect that that would just skyrocket as far as. Um, and I'm not really sure uh, how it, if if the government is taking over all of funding. What's going to happen? To, so, are all those endowed chairs going to just kind of be irrelevant? Um, so, that's the question about what it, it's all going to be about: re, how resources are going to be allocated, and how are uh, what's this going to do for um, as the quality of education as well? Is it, it if you look at um, high school or, or elementary school education, that's a, it's almost a single payer system. If if not, it is being it is so. 
we and we can look at the effects of that. You know, it's just poor results, more money being thrown at it, and pretty much the same quality or value, um, if not going going downward. So, um, you know, so I think it's going to make a lot of private institutions more uh, part of the government uh, arm or part of being public employee employees. So that might be obviously a negative. Um, it's going to disincentivize a lot of like um, cheap, cheap, uh, low cost um, forms of education. As a software developer, um, I can tell you that the um, market for learning how to code yourself is really is re really vibrant. So if if this is going to come along, I think that's going to squash a lot of budding entrepreneurs that are creating really cool sc screencast type. Um, ways of self self teaching yourself. Um, at least that's my experience from a software developer. So, and then lastly, I'm going to say that which the government subsidizes is going to control. So it's going to have a huge amount of influence on what is going to be taught, if it are more than what it does right now. So those are just a few of the things that I would I would say about trying to identify some winners and losers, at least from an economic and economic. Right. One thing uh, that Andy touched base on that I think is worth noting is that how he said he's a software developer is just kind of brings upon a point is that like you know, if you say for instance that making widgets is a hundred thousand dollar a year job for whatever combination of reasons, government comes along and says you know we need to make everyone a widget maker, um, everybody will be well off. Well off. Let's send everyone to widget making school. The price of those schools would skyrocket. The quality of its product or the education in this case would plummet, and the market would be flooded with widget makers. Um, the wages of the widget makers would correspondingly plummet at the same time and the whole rest of the market is just going to uh, the production of all the goods and services would suffer as everybody you know stops making whatever that else they might have might have. Sure. Okay well uh, let's move on to a different topic then I kinda wanted to start with a uh, softball question but here's the one I'm really interested in because this is one that I, I think some liber libertarian advocates for uh, Bernie Sanders have a valid point on and and that's some of his foreign policy issues Andy we'll, we'll start with you again since you spoke last last time but Bernie Sanders seems to have a pretty good track record on uh, foreign intervention on war his voting record is pretty non-interventionist, certainly relative to the other candidates. Is that not a reason itself to, to support him as a libertarian? Yeah, I think I think so. Um, I, I One of the reasons why I think I've come on, come on to the libertarian, uh, um, to libert libertarian as it is, is, is because of uh, my, my realization that war is just one of the most immoral acts there is out there, most heinous things that the state does. You know, it's... Um, it's just terrible. So I think, if anything, that's probably the most virtuous thing any leftists or any people on the socialist side, if they are really, truly, honestly for um, peace and for maybe uh, staying out of other people's um, affairs, whether it's in the Middle East or, or whatever, um, I, th I think that's a, definitely something to support them, support them on. Okay, so maybe there is some merit to um, some of these. I know I've got one of the articles by a Reason writer pointing up, and he points out uh, his his um, his record on on war voting. Uh, so Jeff, do you agree? Um, as far as uh, Bernie Sanders, I, I you know I was I was I was bittersweet to find out that you know he actually voted against the Iraq War because when I say bittersweet is because. I don't like him, and I don't want to have reasons to l agree with him. Sure. But uh, anyways, I, I, I like the fact that he was in a, a for the Iraq war, and he was somewhat similar to Ron, uh, Ron Paul as far as going after the uh, as far as going after the people who were responsible for 9/11. So um, what I would say that I didn't really like when I went on to Bernie Sanders' website today and found out some of his foreign policy is that he. And on the website, it was actually seeming to say we need to kind of, you know, protect our interests, of, you know, abroad and and fight fight kind of fight terrorism. So although he would, didn't seem as much as a war hawk as neoconservatives or what Obama has been since he's been in office, I would say that some of what he was actually advocating for would, in a way, still have some blowback 
you know, towards our country because although he's not, like I said, not as much as a war hawk, what he, uh, what, when I was reading his website, it was kind of saying that he would want to go and, for instance, want to kind of be a peacemaker and, uh, as the U.S. should be kind of leading and being a peacemaker. And I think that's just going to create, create more problems. Um, so in, in a way, I do agree with him. Um, and commend him on where he's done well, but looking at his website today and on the issues, I kind of was thinking that what he would be proposing is is going to be probably more of what we've been receiving from Obama and, and, and Bush is because at first you want to try and create peace by diplomacy, it's not going to work, and then you're just going to keep, kind of like what Ron Paul said, you can't fight an idea, you can't fight terrorism, you, you can't you know, there was one interview that he said with someone who, uh, when he was criticizing the war policy, and the lady asked Ron Paul, um, you know, uh, you know, he uh, said to, someone was asking Ron Paul, who would you, uh, wouldn't you want to go after the people who caused it? And he says, who caused it? And he says, the terrorists. And he mentioned you can't fight an idea. So if you're going to, you're going to go after the terrorists in general or terrorism, it's just going to be an endless endless war on terrorism. So, you know, he was good on Afghanistan and, and Iraq, so I can see why libertarians side with him there, but I think that uh, down the road with what he proposes, it'll just be more of the same. So would it be fair to say, if I can sum up your position concisely, and you tell me if I'm getting it right here, uh, his voting record is, is legitimately relatively solid on this area, but some of his stated positions seem to be the same vague bromides we we see from all the other politicians that kind of make him seem maybe a little bit more wishy-washy is, is that what is that what I'm hearing from yeah, you? I, okay. I, exactly so I agree that he was you know his voting record is great but based off you know his proposals you know I could automatically give him you know a Nobel Peace Prize based off his proposals but we'll you know look who got the last Nobel Peace Prize for being a presidential candidate <laughs> Two of them. Hey, he's getting a second one, isn't he? Okay, Jeff, sorry, I'm, I'm I, have one, I, have one question, yeah. I have one question for Jeff since he's kind of more familiar with Bernie's, uh, like his stances and stuff. Would you say that he's more like a pro UN type of guy to handle oh. foreign affairs? I was reading, like I said, I was reading his website, and when I found out, he mentioned the world words, and it kind of made me cringe because it said world government type thing. I'm not, okay. I'm not going to say it said yeah. the words world government, but he was invoking kind of a world UN type international uh, type of thing that I, I could not get on board with that. I was like, oh. Maybe, I think the reason why I'm uh, uh, lukewarm on, like you, like both all of you have said, he's, his voting record is pretty clean, but he, there are a couple of spots. I mean, I believe there was Kosovo and I'm one Kosovo is one that, that I remember hearing about, yeah. Oh. I get the idea that his his support for for peace and non-intervention is not it's not from a principled stance of non-intervention. I mean, it's it's I have no doubt that he believes. I mean, he almost certainly. I mean, he demonstrably believes in collective security at, at home. You know, whether you're talking about borders or whatever. So I am. I would be very wary of his uh, his stances towards, you know, where you're talking about the UN or NATO or any other, I mean, it's very Wilsonian from what I can tell, not nearly as interventionist, uh, at least not outright, but if it came down to quote-unquote altruistic intervention or anything that maybe for some sort of uh, humans, human rights violations overseas, you know, and of course that's most of the justifications these days, I certainly wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't surprise me all that much for, for someone of because uh, once again, I think it just comes from his. It's it's kind of he just feels it out. I think more than it's a strict. Uh, yeah, I hate to say you know a Noam Chomsky type of you know the, if you're talking about other leftists who who have a, a much more I think grounded uh, principles of of non of non intervention. So I, once again, I just I don't think that his is is that reliable. Just judging from the couple of blotches that he does have on his record. Sure. Okay, so let's uh, let's jump into another one that I know we Austrians like, um, and that's banking. Another thing he uh, he claims to be very very against the big investment banks. Now I always think 
Um, the Federal Reserve here, uh, obviously, generally, as Austrians, we're going to be against the central bank, the Federal Reserve, and any banks that receive any form of like government-sponsored privileges. In that regard, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily what Bernie Sanders is saying, um, but he's certainly against some of the the uh, the big banking um, industry to some degree. Would you not, guys not agree with that? Is that not a merit of his? He's he's certainly pissed off, and uh, you know <laughs> to give him credit for that, I guess you know he's uh, he. I mean, I think that's part of his appeal. Like you were comparing him to Trump earlier, you know he's, you know he's he's mad as hell, and he's not going to take it anymore. The only thing is, it's kind of like the Occupy Wall Street people is that they're occupying on Wall Street and not in Washington. So I mean, he's he's got he's 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 angry for the right reasons, or at least part of the right reasons. It's just he's not taking it out on the right people for the right. Uh, you know, for Jeff, is he right about the banks? Uh, you know, I, I agree that I agree. You know, as an Austrian, that if 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 I think that allowing the banks to fail and cleaning the market with uh, all that you know waste and misallocation of resources is a great thing. You know, if go if if, if companies want to take on risk and they fail, then you know, just like the, just like the just like the video. Hayek versus Keynes in this round two, how he says, you know, capitalism is about profit and loss. You know, we uh, in in a market society, in, in capital, and you know, in a free and laissez-faire capitalist society, if a bank was to fail, then they should fail. Um, one thing I was noticing, I'm not sure how accurate this is because there seems to be this Facebook meme school of economics that seems to go around that they just post a meme and it's automatically true. So I didn't investigate it as much, but from my understanding, as I did some searching, and it founds out that although he's against big banks, he's not for, he opposed the auditing of the Fed, which is the culprit of all the, all the like, for instance, he, he rallies about the 2008 financial crisis and blames Wall Street and wants to go after the bankers, but he opposes the audit of the Phil, the audit of the Fed bill, or auditing the Fed when it's pretty much the bank that's giving everyone the alcohol that's getting drunk off of it. So, um, like yeah, people I, said, I, he's, I he's, he has a focus on the right problem, but he's got a wrong prescription and a wrong di diagnosis. <laughs> every, every big bank except for that one that has government <laughs> privileges, is that what it is? It reminds me of Elizabeth Warren. I know she's a similar position. She's going to gripe all day about the big banks, but she's not um, standing up to the Federal Reserve. Um, I know he did. Uh, he did also oppose the bailouts. And Andy, I'll, I'll hear your thoughts on this. Um, this reminded me a little bit of Ron Paul. Ron Paul actually took. Uh, well, if we can't have this, at least let's have this position on the bailouts. He said, uh, "I I disagree with the bailout. But even if we're going to spend that money, like it would be better to give it to the people holding the mortgages, not the banks." And that seems to be Bernie Sanders' position. Obviously, he would just absolutely advocate. Um, giving it to the people, not giving it back to the taxpayers, uh, but it still was very similar, I thought, to to Ron Paul's position in in terms of opposing the bailouts, which is let's not give it back to the Wall Street um, CEOs, let's not give it back to these big banks. W what do you think about his his opposition to the bail bailouts in context of? Well, I think it's campaign? I think it's, it parallels a lot of other things that like you're sort of on board, like you're 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 like yeah, but then there's like a a little hint of skepticism, be like, yeah. he can't quite be right on this. For you know, he, there's got to be something miss, he's missing. And like for example, a lot of people that are anti-Fed, they want to have the Treasury print money instead of having like a private, a quote private bank that has the monopoly privilege to uh, print coin money or whatever. So um, I'd be, I, I need to know a little bit more. Like his. Is uh, I'd be under interested to know why he was like one of Ron Paul's, you know, like kind of co-sponsors in the in the Senate for auditing the Fed, and then he backed out at the wrong time. Like, did somebody twist his arm and then he caved in, or or what was what was that? I, I need to know. I so I, I claim a little ignorance as far as un I I need to understand a little bit better where he's coming from. What are his principles? Which I'm sure. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm just skeptical that they're going to be sound in any way, shape, or form. Um, obviously, if he wants to um, revoke certain privileges um, to big banks or those sorts of things, um, I'm, I'm for those sorts of 
I'm, I'm for that. But again, th I think there's a difference between supporting somebody that has like a um, a bill that's like an audit of the Fed versus entrusting that somebody's going to be great on monetary policy. Um, just because I'm I'm skeptical of his economic grasp of banking in general. <laughs> so I mean, does he know about f f uh, fiat? Uh, um, or I'm sorry. Uh, Fractional reserve banking, like that, that is to me is is the key thing that has to go hand in hand with knowing, you know, why the Federal Reserve is bad. Is because the only reason the Federal Reserve is there is to be a prop for these fractional reserve banks that don't, that are always going to be prone to collapse when when there's a, a downturn and they have to um, redeem all these or they have to make make good all these bad loans that went sour. So. Okay, well, let me follow up on this then. So Bernie Sanders, of course, uh, voted for all the spending bills. Uh, he, he calls himself a socialist, he, but he's clearly at least an extreme Keynesian, so he, he's voted for any, any stimulus package. Um, I, I, would, I would posit that I think he knows exactly the relationship between the Federal Reserve and uh, all these these appropriations of spending in terms of make work projects, he has that you know making well paying jobs on his website, and yeah. that's what he points to as his record on this. Do you think he he knows that connection, or do you think there's just some cognitive dissonance between I, I do oppose the banks, but on the other hand, um, I I favor government spending, and I'm not going to ask where that money comes from. Yeah, I think it's just rooted in like this populism, less this left leaning populism. And um, you know banks are banks are a, a easy whipping boy, um, and especially the Federal Reserve. So uh, I, I I don't I think it's a bit of cognitive distance to to be honest with you, and just not being able to coherently understand um, so you economics. Think he genuinely is unaware of the relationship between the Federal Reserve buying Treasury securities and where the government funds its deficits. And I don't know. I'm I'm just wondering. Um. That's that's an interesting question. I don't I don't know if I'd be capable to answer that. To I, be honest, I myself don't know the answer to that question because it's it's whenever someone in power does something really stupid, like I say, come on, you you have to at least know basic, at least economics one on one to know that something like if, and my my position is that if he, it's very tricky. Is like, does he know what the results of actually the Federal Reserve and and fractional reserve banking are and or does he is does he really not know so that makes me worried that he does know and he doesn't care because and that makes him a bad you know evil person or does is he just really ignorant which makes me even worry more why would you want some ignorant in power if they don't know what the heck is going on but knowing that he's a demagogue I think that with him him wanting power and of course the private sector or any form of the private sector is bad. I think that he's bashing the the corp private sector, Citibank and U.S. Bank and all those banks that got money, but he sees the Federal Reserve as big brother, the government, the the guy that's going to protect protect us from the bigger banks. And um, he's it's just kind of in a way class warfare because he's he's uh, going against the private sector, but he in in for the benefit of actually protecting the government sector or the Federal Reserve. So, yeah. I, like Andy, I can't uh, answer that question as far as I, I don't know, but uh, I've always wondered those things whenever something like this comes up. <laughs> Will, you look like you want to weigh in. Uh, well, you know, when you're, it, of course it's impossible to know. He may have a... Uh, well, Ron Paul was asked a few years ago how many people in, in all of Congress he thought actually really understood uh, the way the Fed works. And he said it was maybe like three or four people. So, <laughs> so I, I tend to think that he's uh, uh, probably mostly, you know, in the dark because you know he does preach a lot about the the evils of greed, and it'd be pretty difficult to reconcile, you know, uh, um, you know his his crusade against against those who wish to accumulate too much wealth and, and, you know, still be able to <laughs> endorse, you know, what the Fed does. But at the same time, I think, you know, I, I, as most progressives, I think it, he's more, more just blinded by his own ideology. It's very, very difficult to be a mercantilist or a protectionist if you don't have the power of the central bank. And so he's willing to probably turn a, bl turn a blind eye to the, uh, the ill effects of, of the central bank because he believes it is a necessary evil so that he can 
carry on whatever uh, policies he deems necessary to you know protect. He sees himself as the great protector of the people, the the people's champ, and uh, you know his he. I mean, it's the elitism. He believes that he knows better. Uh, he knows how to spend the wealthiest Americans' money better than the wealthiest Americans. You know, and that's the whole ninety percent top tax bracket and all that. I mean, he, I, I I think Will has a point as far as uh, the three percent of people in Congress that know that because it's it just you know I mean. You know, and in the grand scheme of things, I think you don't you don't hire people to fix an economy, and it's not like the people are in, you know, in in charge or are unintelligent or corrupt. It's that there's people in charge. You know, if you have to have people in charge, it's be it'd be nice if they had a correct understanding of economics. But if that was the case, we just have people being in charge, and we'd have nothing to pay them for. They just sit around being in charge all day, and we'd have nothing to pay them for because they would know. With you know economics, you don't do anything to try and run an economy. So, Will, you said something else. I kind of want to hear some follow up on you. You uh, referred to uh, mercantilism. Do you think that Bernie Sanders is a mercantilist, or maybe a neo mercantilist, as we would probably call it today? <laughs> well, let's see. I was uh, I was uh, thumbing through some articles today uh, on Bernie Sanders because I hadn't. I, Try not to keep up too much with the day to day because it's depressing. But there was, there was something that he uh, he tweeted out several months ago, and he said in the gift shops of I guess it was in the Capitol building or somewhere in D.C. It says in the in the gift shops we should not be selling statues of founding fathers of this country that were made in China. So I mean uh, that that yeah, was mean, him or was that Donald Trump? Because I get my that. xenophobic you well, know exactly. nationalist. And I was thinking about. If if I had more time and and drive to, to to come up with quotes from the Donald and Bernie and you know I bet there is a at least a couple dozen that would overlap that you know who said it I mean you you could it's a toss up I mean the exact same mentality it's just flipped in in completely different uh, rhetoric I guess but I mean if you were if you asked me to define what a mercantilist was I mean that tweet pretty much embodies the entire spirit to me. I, 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 yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, bring, not, not. bring money back to the, the empire, right? Yeah. Um, I, I, th I think that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, okay, well, I want to kind of get into some of the, the closing questions I had here. Um, we'll, uh, we'll circle back around to Andy. Um, so I, I I like to bring up Walter Block's position when it comes to voting because I, I admire Walter Block and I don't think any of us can uh, really question his libertarian credentials. But he often argues, and he's not supported Bernie Sanders, he supports Rand Paul, by the way, just for the record, so I'm not misrepresenting him. But he often argues um, what I think uh, we heard from Murray Rothbard, which is there is some merit to voting and there is some merit to voting for the lesser of two evils or overseer goody versus overseer. Uh, uh, batty, and I think there's some merit to this argument. I, I don't tend to vote myself just because I think it's useless. I don't think it's immoral. So I'm always kind of curious, uh, you know, people's reasoning behind who they're voting for. So Andy, let's say the primaries are done, and it's Bernie Sanders versus Donald Trump. What do I do? Oh, so you, you get the last question is going to be having to anal to have an analysis of the Donald and Bernie. Okay, we're, we're going to have I think a my head's going to explode because I think I think Donald is is the worst of the Republicans. I think Rand Paul, even though I'm not supporting him, is the best of the Republicans. So let's say part A is uh, Bernie versus Donald. Part B is Bernie versus Rand Paul. What do I do in each of those situations and why? Okay, so Bernie versus uh, the Donald. Well. Um, I do think uh, in that case uh, you do have a, an interesting debate of who has a better hair. So, um, <laughs> so that's that's a that might that's be a good that's, reason to vote for somebody as I've heard. Yeah, that's a, that's a good that's a tough aesthetic question to answer. So, um, as far as Bernie versus, um, I think it really comes down to uh, what's your core, what's your real motivating reason to go to the polls. Like, are you, do you just not want to have this person in, so you're voting for someone else? So or are you Roth like Rothbard, I think, just because I think we all admire Rothbard, he would say war. Uh, his big yes. issue was always war more than anything else. Is that not a reason that a libertarian should vote for Bernie Sanders if he's running against Donald Trump? And, well, the reason I – that's a great uh, segue to what I was going to say because um, – Actually, Walter Block, I think, said a few weeks ago or something that he actually voted for Obama. Obama, yeah, he did. Over, I think, <laughs> Rom Romney because he thought 
Obama uh, I think it was be, uh, McCain. Not, McCain, 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 McCain. I'm sorry, you're right. He voted for Obama over McCain because he thought that Obama would be more of a dove than McCain, which I don't think you could argue with that that logic. So um, I'll, I, I think it, I don't quite yeah. know like Donald's. Uh, what he says on foreign policy, it's kind of debatable. I've heard some people say that he's he's less hawkish than the others, but I just think he's more of a wild card. So I'm going to say I would actually, this saddens me, this kills me to say this, I probably would vote for um, Sanders if war is my, my number one thing that's that's driving me. And I do think, if war is your priority, you would vote for Sanders over Donald Trump? I, I think so because I just I just don't know what, what he, would, he would do. I really don't know. Donald Trump enough. Some people say that he'd be, he'd be actually be a lighter, um, you know, less aggressive, less interventionist than, than all the other Republicans. And if that is I the case, then heard, I have not heard that argument yet. <laughs> <Or am I? laughs> all right, so, let yeah. me let me skip. Let me skip. Jeff, I'm going to come to you last because I'm really anxious to hear your, your yeah. response. But I want to save that for last. Will, Will, what what are your answers to questions A and B? Uh, uh, okay, who to vote for? Uh, Sanders versus Trump. Trump uh, Sanders versus Rand Paul, or oh, okay. anybody well, versus Trump. Okay, well, and, and this is premise on the idea that if I don't vote, I'm gonna get a yeah. Hands. No, I, I'm skipping Jeff because I'm expecting he's gonna say no vote, but maybe well, I mean, I'm displaying again, my hand here. If you're threatening me with violence, then I guess I'll vote. Yeah. For <laughs> okay, so it's more for in elections now. I you have to vote. This has to have a gun to the head type of question. Yeah. Okay, so uh, one of the one of those, but. Uh, you know, I, I think, and Block is, uh, as much as I, I really don't, Rand to me is, is so much more frustrating than someone like, well, I don't want to say he's more frustrating than Bernie, but Rand, you know, I, there was a lot of, there was a lot of hope, hopefulness there that he could really carry the, the torch, and uh, so uh, I just couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to vote for Rand, and also I think that the argument that if Bernie Sanders was elected, you're, it, it's probably I do think that he would be less interventionist abroad, so that would be a plus. Um, and also his rhetoric, he is a self <laughs> self described uh, democratic socialist, or or how you know whatever combination of words he uses for the same uh, same effect. But so I, I think that you know the, the whatever. Bad things that are inevitably coming our way economically could be pinned on someone like Bernie. That would be, I think, that could potentially really help uh, help what we're doing here. You know, the the intellectual cause, give people uh, give people a pause to really really question what what he's all about and what maybe the alternatives are. So maybe get all the socialism out of out of <laughs> the common American voters voter system. And rouse some uh, some curiosity, and who knows? So well, I, you know, I'm, that that is actually an argument that I've made to people. Is like at least Bernie Sanders is calling himself a socialist. So when he screws everything up, he's gonna uh, screw everything up under the guise of socialism, whereas everybody else pretends to be a cap. You know, Donald Trump's not exactly a, a free marketeer here, but he calls himself a capitalist. And, so. people, and really, people really people pegged Rand as some sort of you know off the wall radical. So and I mean so and I. You know, I mean, compared to Jeb Bush, maybe, but compared to Ron Paul, no, uh, so. it's, it's a lot more. Oh, yes. And and you know, Walter Block, for all of his defense, it's purely pragmatic. He even acknowledges that he he's very fall. You know, the apple fell far from the tree. And he gave him something like a seventy on his uh, his 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 vaunted uh, his vaunted freedom. Yeah, <laughs> I read that post as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Jeff. Final word, man. Who who would you vote for in this situation? Oh well. Uh... As far as uh, you touch base on me saying not voting, and, and one key thing that I would ever want to talk to someone there, and if we're kind of aiming this episode at you know the, the libertarian demographic that would support voting or or Bernie, is that you know there's the whole idea that if we can get everyone at the same time to vote for the right person, then we'll have things our way. But I think that if you can, in order to do that, you have to change people's minds, and I think that if we can change everyone's minds, then Voting is obsolete, so I th kind of think that it's 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 the argument can be made, made both ways. But anyway, as far as to address your question, I would say I would love to I I in in principle I would want to vote for I would say that as far as if if Rand could get everything that he wanted to get done done, then I would vote for Rand. However, I know that he 
one, his chances of winning are very small. Two, chances of him getting everything done are probably even a slimmer of a margin. And that being said, if he's in office and he gets nothing done, everyone, the consensus is going to say, see, libertarianism doesn't work. If he was in office, he didn't get anything done, and that's going to be, you know, that's going to be enough reason to condemn libertarianism. Second, if someone gets in, if he gets in office and something bad happens, um, then libertarianism is going to get the blame. And so, for the same reason as you and Will, I kind of uh, would say I would prefer to see Sanders win because I don't think one that we need efficiency experts for the government because the less it sucks, the more people are going to get around want to keep it. So I agree with Dan Sanchez and what he has to say. And then second, I'd, I would love to see, you know, if, if, if under the guise of socialism it fails, and it would, people would have less reason to advocate socialism. So I'd probably want to have, let the, let the you know, this is going to sound bad to libertarians, but if the state runs amok and people can see how bad the state is, then they'll want to have the state around less. Yeah, I and you know, vote voting for the worst candidate to to just speed up the collapse. Yeah. Uh, I know I've heard that argument from some libertarian. I think Brian McClanahan in one of his lectures that I listened to, he brought up that point. I don't know if he was advocating it, but he certainly brought it up. I I always think it's an interesting point. I like the idea. I mean, I I would rather see Bernie Sanders get elected if everything's just going to go to crap anyway. At least then it's called socialism. But I, I I'm just going to give my answer to this question. If it were between Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, and there was a gun to my head, I'd probably just take the bullet. I mean, is that fair to say? Like, I, I think that might be the best course of action at that I, point. I think uh, one thing that a libertarian, even libertarians actually don't recognize, and there's this quote by uh, Mises that says, is there's no ending, I don't know what his exact words is, that you can't stop the, you can't stop a bubble from bursting once it actually, once you're on the path of it actually collapsing, there's no means that can stop it. It's going to pop, no matter what, the bubble will pop. So I think that, you know, something bad may happen coming down the road. I'm not going to make a quantitative prediction, um, but I think that sometimes libertarians even forget that they think that by voting in Rand sometimes that they're going to stop a supposed bubble from popping, and there's no way that it can actually... They might slow it, but they're probably not going to stop it. Right? Yeah, it's just not going to... It's going to... The most you can do is eventually it'll actually pop. The most you can hope for is how bad it's going to be, and that's only determined on how long you want to prolong it. And uh, Jeff, Jeff, it's not a bubble popping, it's just economic adjustment, right? So it's, yeah. uh, it's a correction, it's market corrections. <laughs> okay, it. so uh, we're, we're pretty, pretty uh, much close to the end of our time, so 30 seconds. Will, give me your final thoughts here. Uh, final thoughts. Uh, I think we, uh, well, I like the show. <laughs> I mean, it's a cool format. Uh, do you, you want to you wanna give me more of a <laughs> topic there? Nope, just final thoughts, man, if that's what you got. I kind of meant final th thoughts on Bernie Sanders, but yeah. we'll take it. Final thoughts on the show, cool. Oh, uh, no, uh, uh, let's see. Bernie, I think, you know, there's there's a lot more that could be said, but, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's... He's different, and I, I, something that I wanted to mention earlier, he, I, I also read this interesting article. He, he was actually fairly radical in the 70s. He was anti-compulsory schooling, and he's actually a, a lot more pro-gun than most uh, leftists. So, I, I mean, he's, he's, he's an interesting character, even though he's, you know, well, the crazy... Well, Karl Marx was pretty pro-gun, so maybe that's just part of his Marxism. <laughs> Andy, final thoughts. Uh, so, yeah, I think... Uh... Bernie, like he, I, I appreciate, I think one of you guys said, I'm not sure if it was you, Chris, um, or you, Will, that, or you, Jeff, um, if, that oh. he is an, he's an honest, he's an honest socialist. So he's explicit. I appreciate him versus like a, a Hillary Clinton who wants to, um, you know, focus group your, her, all of her answers, even though she's really a, a you know, almost a social, as a socialist as uh, somebody like a Bernie Sanders, but Bernie is explicit in, in his uh, in his socialism, and he's, you know, a, a pretty standard democratic socialist of, like, a European bent. So um, I appreciate that aspect of him, even though, and so it, it tells you exactly who he is. So um, but one final comment on, on our show is I was, rec I was just wanting to make a revelation that 
Um, maybe we could add something to the show, um, like a subtitle, is We the Individuals with Great Facial Hair. <laughs> Since we're all uh, supporting a, 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 a modestly bearded gentleman. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> See, that could have been a name for the show, Jeff. Why don't we come up with that? The modestly bearded gentleman. <laughs> Jeff, what are your final thoughts on Bernie? Uh, I think as far as Bernie in general, it kind of makes me want to say that I think as far as final thoughts is for libertarians and any non-libertarians that would be watching this, it kind of stresses my importance on you know, learning economics because for a reason like this, I mean, you know, the, you know, the average Joe doesn't think she, you know, he or she cares about economic theory, but, you know, the same individual like Bernie won't hesitate to tell you all the, about all the consequences of a policy change. You know, I mean, libertarians and liberals in general have most of the, you know, have most of the same goals in, in terms of economic, economic policy in mind. We want fewer poor people. We want the remaining um, poor to be better off and so on. But we only, we only generally disagree about means, and that's what economics is for. And then, so, you know, people only support, you know, social welfare programs because they, for some mind-boggling reason, according to some economic theories, they probably don't even realize they're using that those are the best and only ways to help the poor or disadvantaged. So I think it makes me stress on that's the importance of learning economics, and sure. um, that's my final thoughts on right. him. Who cares who you vote for? Go read a an econo Go read Mises, yeah. right? Yeah, you. I mean, that's what economics is for: is finding out what the sure. you know. I mean, we all have the same goals, but we can find out what those means are, and economics is probably the best way of doing that. Well said. Well said. Okay, cool. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for today. Um, for anybody watching, thank you for tuning in to our first episode of this. I know this is going to be posted on We the Individuals. Uh, since this is our first episode, we're kind of getting some tweaks out. We would love to hear some input, and if anybody has some topics they'd be interested in hearing about, um, we are trying to compile a good running list of things worth talking about for about 45 minutes. So give us your input, leave us some feedback, and uh, we'll be back uh, next week. Week, Jeff, is that right? Yes, we will. <laughs> cool. All right. We'll see you then. Thanks for coming on, guys.